So the Bible tells us that there are two types of people. There are people who are vessels of mercy. And then there are people who are vessels of wrath. Like all generations will be using you to know about the wrath of God. That don't play with God. Don't see what he did to Pharaoh. Because hardness of heart is a false sense of courage. Do you understand what I'm saying? Misplaced courage. When the evidence is clear. But you delude yourself to move on in ignorance. No, I will not agree. So let me tell you something. There are some people that believe that you are destined to be beneath them. That's, that's why. They just couldn't, he just couldn't see the children of Israel free. That's the problem. And that is the very thing that led him to his destruction. And it is part time throughout the Bible that when people see you as small, see you as slaves, see you as something, someone that can never get anywhere in life, their wickedness will end up amplifying his glory in your life. That is how he does it. Hallelujah. So I'm going to start a teaching series for Wednesdays in Abuja, right? So I'm going to be teaching on believer's authority. Believer's authority. And we're going to start with a Bible study today and see where the Lord takes us this month. Please be aware there will be some Wednesdays I will ask you to fast. That's not a problem, is it? Um, there will be some Wednesdays I would ask you to intercede for your family. You know, and let's just see what God has in store. So much to cover in such a short time. So let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I will title my teaching, even though the series is Believer's Authority, the teaching specifically today, I will title it The Exodus. The Exodus. So it's a scanty Bible commentary on the book of Exodus, specifically the Exodus of God's people, out of Egypt and I just want to point out a few things there but I want to prefix what I want to teach with a very familiar text in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 1 we'll read from verse 1 to 7 but I want to just take it as systematically as possible from verse 1 it says now concerning spiritual gifts Brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Everybody read 1 Corinthians 12, 1 together. 1, 2, go. Now, in case you don't see the seeming contradiction in this verse, it means you've not been paying attention. Because if you've read 1 Corinthians, you know, from beginning to end, you see immediately that there's something missing here. What do you mean that you don't want the church of Corinth to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts? Let me tell you something. There are a lot of, of Corinth, but you cannot put spiritual gifts and ignorance in the same sentence. It's not possible. In fact, that was their number one problem. That was their number one identity. They spoke in tongues so much it had to be regulated. And Paul had to say, calm down. I speak in tongues more than you all. But listen. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. You've read that far in the book of First Corinthians, haven't you? I mean, the book literally opens up by Paul saying, I thank God concerning you for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus Christ. First Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 4. That you are enriched in everything by him in utterance and knowledge. It says, even as the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gifts. So this was a church, when you looked in their midst, looked at their open modus operandi, looked at how they had services, you couldn't see shortage of any gifts. And so when in chapter 12, he now says, I would not have you ignorant. There's, there's something we're missing here. And so what, what I want you to see is this. The ignorance he's talking about is not general ignorance per se. There is a specific aspect of spiritual gifts that he wants to highlight that they do not seem to understand. 
Which is why in the next verse, he says, You know that you were Gentiles carried away by dumb idols, however you were led. So he's reminding them of where they are coming from. You see, the Corinthians, they were idol worshippers before. And so he seems to suggest that there is something about their background that has created in them a mental model. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like a form of syncretism where they think that how they used to do it is still how it operates. A lot of Nigerian Christians are like that. The way they go about their Christianity, you will wonder if it's an idol they are worshipping. They just mix everything, every, everything. So what is it about where they are coming from that made them miss something very important about spiritual gifts? Look at verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Everybody say there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of administrations, of activities, but the same God who works all in all. That is the difference. In paganism, listen carefully. In paganism, every idol is a specialist. Every idol is a specialist. And so you had a different God for fertility. And, but when it came to war, the God of fertility can't help you. And so you need the God of war. But when it came to commerce, the God of war can't help you. So you need the God of commerce. In such a way that you have a plethora of God and a range of powers all of them working together. Come on, are you getting what I'm saying? But you need to understand that in Christ, hey, come on, are you getting what I'm saying? You have one spirit and different administrations. You don't need many gods. One is enough. In fact, there is only one God who administers and operates in different ways. Are you getting what I'm saying? And as simple as you think this is, a lot of Christians don't seem to get it. You have the Holy Ghost. Why do you think you are lacking in spiritual gifts? Do you hear what I said? If you have the Holy Ghost, why do you think you are lacking? Don't you understand? And this is how he begins to teach on spiritual gifts. A lot of believers still don't get it. Because you hear a lot of believers say things like, I have four spiritual gifts, and you have five spiritual gifts. You know, the first time I taught on this, it was 2009, thereabouts. Because even if I was not a pastor then, it was clear in the word. Every gift he was itemizing, he says, faith by the same spirit. Tongues by the same spirit. Interpretation of tongues by the same spirit. Walking of miracles by what? So he's emphasizing one spirit. Walking all and through all and in all. Say loud, Amen. Say the same spirit. the same spirit. Come on, say the same spirit. the same spirit. So listen, in paganism, you don't have an omnipotent God. But he's letting them know the true God is omnipotent. Amen, somebody. Shout the same spirit. spirit. Uh -huh. So you don't need to look for different powers. No Abito Sheka, no Kadush Kaba. The same God walking all through all. There is no insufficiency in you. If you have the Holy Ghost, you have all that pertains to life and godliness. Say loud amen if you believe that. What does this have to do with Exodus? Everything. Because it's the same idea, the same flow of thoughts. 
And if you, you can't understand what is happening in Exodus if you don't get this. And I've tried very hard to simplify it. You know, I've studied a lot of materials. I've studied this for years. Brilliant Bible teachers like one rabbi, David Foreman, you know, and a lot of other materials. And of course, you know, the Bible itself. So here are things you should know about the gods of Egypt. Number one, that there is no single creator of all. Do you understand what I'm saying? Instead, they dependent, they dependent on different ranges, ranges of power. They depended on different range of powers. They believe that the heavens are populated with different range of powers. Number two, their gods were not personal gods. They don't like you. They don't want anything to do with you. Once in a while, they just get angry and they just send one hurricane and you quickly run and offer a sacrifice to appease them. You can't control them, but at least you can appease them. So they believe that they were behind natural disasters. And so listen to this. The first thing that throws you up off about the book of Exodus is the name itself. If you think that the book of Exodus was just about the Exodus, you have missed it. Because when you study the book carefully, you will see. Are you ready for this? God was not trying to help the children of Israel escape. He was not. That was not the main goal. If it was the main goal, he would have done it since. Let me tell you something. And this was one of the first things I studied and I discovered years ago when I was reading the book. It was clear. Before the first plague, God already told Moses, I know that Moses, that Pharaoh will not let my people go except with a strong guard. And so if Israel is my firstborn and he won't let my firstborn go, I will kill his firstborn. So, right from the onset, he knew what he needed to do. The climax of miracles that will finally let Pharaoh let them go. He knew. So, why did he start with all the small plagues? Because there was something deeper he was trying to achieve. Are you getting it now? If you read the story carefully, you will see that, in fact... The children of Israel had many opportunities to run away. Let me show you something. Let me even ask you this. Are you aware that God wanted Pharaoh by himself to tell them to go? He didn't try to forcefully whisk them away. Isn't that interesting? Why didn't he just tell them, all of you go and let's see what they will do. And then as they are trying to stop them, maybe strange things are happening and all of that. That's not what happened. You think God couldn't have done that? Let me ask you something you didn't think of. When all of Egypt was dark, pitch dark, and there was light in Goshen, wasn't that a good opportunity? Oh yeah, run, 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 run. But God allowed the darkness to pass. Ah, hey, God. <laughs> the God of the Bible. <laughs> he wanted it to be clear. We, this is not a contest. We are not mates. He wanted Pharaoh to by himself say go. He wanted him to be at his wit's end. <laughs> That's very important right there. <laughs> and then most importantly, 
He wanted to reveal who the true God was. It was power evangelism. What did I call it? He wanted to use the power display to evangelize, to let the world know. You know, I've told you this before. Maybe you have forgotten. If you are wondering why Jonah's evangelism was so effective, thank Moses. Thank Moses. Because by the time a Hebrew prophet comes and says, thus says the Lord, eh? <laughs> now there is precedence. Everybody has heard of the foolishness of Pharaoh. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> the king of Nineveh said, everybody, if I see food for your mouth, God, we are sorry. <laughs> he wasn't trying to find out. They repented instantly. Because you were wondering, Jonah didn't perform one single miracle. He just preached. He didn't even preach well. I've told you that before now. He didn't want them to convert. He wanted God to punish them. So he preached it in a way that they won't believe. <laughs> That's why when they converted, he was angry. Read Jonah 4. He was angry. He told God, kill me. You know? <laughs> he said, this is why I didn't want to go. That is why he didn't want to go. Because he didn't want them to repent. Because of Moses, a lot of other people, it was easy for them to believe, including Rahab. She said, the God that parted the Red Sea. She said, listen, I know God has given you Jericho. Let's negotiate. I will help you. Just help me. <laughs> I, I'm not playing. I'm not playing with you all. Because God used that as an opportunity to reveal himself. Amen, somebody. And so, look at what God said. Exodus chapter 7 verse 5. Exodus chapter 7 verse 5. I need to move faster now. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. This wasn't about bringing them out alone. Do you see that? It says the Egyptians shall know. Not just the Jews. He said, the Egyptians, when I'm done, they will know that I'm the Lord. Not that I am a God. He wanted to expose the folly of all their false gods. One of whom was Pharaoh, by the way, in case you didn't know. Pharaoh was a God title. God of the earth. And God is like, okay. Lace up. They shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Look, look at chapter 12, verse 12. I've told you this before, that all the, the plagues were specifically to expose the folly of the gods that the Egyptians were worshipping. I've told you that before, remember? For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods. Say, against all the gods. So this wasn't just against the, the administrative leadership. It was against the gods. So this was a showdown to reveal to the world who the true God is. The story that can help you understand this better is simple. What Elijah did. Mount Carmel. 1 Kings 18. How long will you vacillate between two opinions? If God is God, honor him and worship him. And so when they were, they, there was no response, he says, okay, set up altars. I will call my God, you'll call your God. The God that answers by fire, let him be God. It was a similar thing that Moses and the magicians of Egypt were doing. 
Are you getting it now? So it wasn't just about bringing the children of Israel. If I can tell you one thing, God could have brought, it didn't have to, it didn't take 10 plagues. If the angel of death went family to family and touched only one person, <laughs> what does that tell you? All of them could have died. All of them could have died. So it wasn't about escape. Escaping was easy. You know what God said? <laughs> God, they brag. Forgive me. <laughs> he said, you saw the way I played with the God of Egypt. <laughs> That's what, that was the language he used. I, I, I played, I toyed with them. <laughs> I wish I can go through all these texts. Let's see how far we can go. So how is God going to do this? God wants to prove that there is one God and he is that one God. That there is indeed an almighty God, not a plethora of powers. Not so many Els and Elohims. That there is one almighty so how is he going to do that? Number one, he's going to display all the powers, all the powers that they think they attribute to different gods. He's going to, he alone will, will display all of them one after the other. So by the time the river turns to blood, oh, the river God is angry. Okay. Okay. Then, now, there are frogs everywhere. Oh, maybe the amphibian god teamed up with the river god. That seems contradictory to the way paganism works because they believe that all the gods were rivals. But, eh, well, maybe just two. That is possible. But when the locusts are ravaging their crops, they now say, ah, Mm -mm. this can no longer be a coincidence it is this Moses and his God are you getting what I'm saying that is doing all these things it's all happening back to back oh we thought it was different so you mean there is a deity out there that all these our gods are subservient to that even when these are our magicians that we've revered drop their rods and they turn to serpents, his own serpents swallow their own. So now I'm learning that power, Pastor. Are, are you getting it now? Again, we're talking about believers' authority. This is important. Let me show you something very interesting. Exodus chapter 9 verse 24. <laughs> you see, God was out to help them deconstruct. He wanted to rubbish everything they thought they knew. This was a theological conquest to help them rethink their theology. You know what the Bible says? It says, so there was hail mingled with what? You know, so what, you know, <laughs> so just imagine snow and fire together. It, it, scientifically, how does that work? Ice and fire. So there was fire and covered with ice. How does this work? And so you have to understand how confusing this is for a pagan pagan. Because even if any two gods want to collaborate, ice and fire, what is, what is this? And how is this even possible? How are you having this at the same time? I 
and there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. They had not seen anything like that before. Are you paying attention to the details now? <laughs> so the first thing God did to line everything up one after the other so that they, they'll be like, oh, it is one being controlling, one force controlling everything. He's challenging this polytheistic theology that, oh, there is one God. That's not the only thing he did. Number two, he demonstrated controlled power. Can you say controlled power? Because you have to understand that, you see, in paganism, you can appease the gods, but you can't control the outcomes. You, can't, you can mitigate the outcomes. Ah, the god is angry. See, people are dying. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah oh. You, you know, yeah. then you carry something, slaughter, you know, and then the god will calm down. But you know what God does? God wants to make sure that Pharaoh knows this is not a natural disaster. So everything that is happening is happening only in the Egyptian camp. You, get, you have to understand how important that detail is. That when there is darkness, Goshen has light. And that when the livestock are dying, Goshen is okay. So this is not, let me tell you something. Even if it was just the first one, that's still cool. That you can control all of them back to back, that's powerful. But then again, not only are they all happening back to back, it's happening only here. So, <laughs> indeed, these people have a partnership with the God that they worship. Are you getting what I'm saying? This, they, they are this, oh my God. This is, this is a theological quagmire. <laughs> what is going on here? So let me show you something you also never paid attention to. Probably. Look at Exodus chapter 9 verse 7. So when there was a plague, see what Pharaoh did. Exodus 9, 7. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead. But why was that important? He wanted to know it's not a natural disaster. Because if, it was, if, if everybody is suffering, you just say, it's the timing. Somehow, maybe through astrology, you could tell that all these events, and then you use it to booger us. But now it's controlled. Only here. He went to check. They said, all their livestock still alive and well. Ha. But Pharaoh became hard. The heart of Pharaoh became hard. I wish... It, if we have enough time, we'll talk about that. It's very simple and you're going to get it. <laughs> so what is number one? And what is number two? Number three. Precision. Precision. All these plagues... They started when Moses said they will start and ended when Moses said they will end. See, you have to understand, in paganism, you can appease the gods, but you can't, you can't say definitively it will stop. You, you can't say that. Who are you? You, can, you, you want control, Shongo?
See, what I'm about to read to you, it will trip you. Moses, guess where I go? Leave her. <laughs> so now there's a plague. So let me tell you something. Before I move to that, you see, Pharaoh was a psychopath. <laughs> I, there's something you never thought about. You know all the plagues that were disturbing Egypt, Pharaoh tried to replicate them. So he was more concerned about matching the power than the welfare of his people. Do you see it was not about Exodus? It was power, but it was a power tussle. How can you see frogs and you tell the magicians, go and do your own? <laughs> Frog is disturbing everybody. You tell them to go and, get, go and do your own frog. <laughs> Are you getting this? Psychopath. So some of, some of the plagues, they could start. But now, look at this. In Exodus chapter 8, you're going to love this. <laughs> if you don't read your Bible, you damn me so. I don't know. What are you reading? So now, there's a plague. Pharaoh has started begging. Oh, yeah, stop the plague. Look at verse 9, Exodus 8, 9. And then Moses says, you know what? I'm going to give you the honor. Pick the time you want it to stop. <laughs> he said, accept the honor of saying when I should intercede for you, for your servants and for your people, to destroy the frogs from the houses, that it will remain in the river only. He's, Pick the time. He's, oh God, are, are you getting this? This is not an accident this is not a natural disaster. And just so we are clear, so you know I'm not making, this is not some gimmick. Pick the time. And to prove, indeed, that Pharaoh is a madman. You know when Pharaoh said? Look at the next verse. And Pharaoh said when? <laughs> I said he demand a mad. You don't understand? Something that was disturbing the whole, you know, just to, he wanted to drag it and see. <laughs> so he said, tomorrow, I will manage one more night. <laughs> just, oh my God, you... It's like you have not tried to argue with Pharaoh before. You have seen people like this before. They can never agree. <laughs> they can never agree. So again, it was not about escaping. Not about escaping. If it was about escaping, they had ample opportunity. Ample opportunity. They could have escaped when all of Egypt had boils. And if it was about escaping, why are you reversing the plagues? Why are you reversing the plagues? Or you think God was really buying it, that they would just beg, 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 beg. You know, say, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, boy, you disappear. Really? If now you go. <laughs> Do you understand? Until you get to Sinai like this. <laughs> Before that boy go. <laughs> That's where the last boy will, will burst. You imagine it, that's why you're laughing. You are wicked. <laughs> it wasn't about escaping. It wasn't. 
It wasn't. God wanted to prove a point. The last night, he said, have a party. Eat. This is your last night. <laughs> your last night in Egypt. Think about that. He, he, he stretched it. He, you, 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 you have to understand, the goal was to humble a megalomaniac. Let him realize this was not just to reveal that there is a God. It is to reveal you are not him. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? That you, you, like others, are one of his subjects. You, like others, are one of his subjects. You know, we got to a point when it got to the plague of the boils. Even the magicians couldn't come out. All of them get. <laughs> Where are the magicians? Boil. <laughs> Sick leave. Do you know what? Do you know what it takes for your magician to tell you this is the finger of God? Do you know? Do you know what? Have you ever thought about that? That that is resignation. You don't know. That I've been lying to you. <laughs> the meaning I've been lying to you who I worship is not God for him to say this is the vigor of God like bag bag. <laughs> leave these people low. when even your magicians resign you still say hmm. Be because you have to understand ah, you've been lying to your people you have been Acting like God. Now, these slave people are showing you up. Are you getting what I'm saying? You have to understand, for a proud man with a God complex, it was too much. When you understand that, you will understand the concept of hardness of heart. What does it mean to harden your heart? It simply means when the evidence becomes clear, but you still don't agree. <laughs> That's what this problem is. And that's why that term was used in evangelism, Hebrews 4. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. It means it has been proven beyond reasonable doubt. The gospel has been revealed to you. You know it's true. Don't hold on to it for pride's sake. Or because what will people say? Do you understand that? Even your own magicians don't advise you, this is God, oh. sir, he's God. Come on, are you getting this? Yes, and in what way did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Very simple. First and foremost, it was until about the fifth plague that you ever see the Bible say God had in Pharaoh's hearts. Because hardness of heart is a false sense of courage. Do you understand what I'm saying? Misplaced courage. Misplaced courage. When the evidence is clear, but you delude yourself, to move on in ignorance. No, I will not agree. There are people who do that. You've argued with people like that. <laughs> I'm not going to give examples today. And so when, this is the rule. In Romans chapter 1, the Bible says, as they did not withhold God in their consciousness. He gave them up to a reprobate mind. So you see, God can aid us. He can give you courage. Mm. Do you understand? In the direction and in the path that you have already chosen. And I want to tell you why that is important. 
The reason that is important is simply this. And listen carefully so you don't, don't misunderstand it. For two reasons. Number one, if God has already determined that Pharaoh cannot repent, if you cannot repent, you can at least be the reason why others will repent. Are you getting what I'm saying? So the Bible tells us that there are two types of people. There are people who are vessels of mercy. And then there are people who are vessels of wrath. Like, all generations will be using you to know about the wrath of God. That don't play with God, though. See what he did to Pharaoh. Don't forget, Pharaoh is not innocent. You don't have to read the Bible to know that you don't kill the firstborn of all the, of, of all the Israelites. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is even mercy that God spoke to him at all and said, let my people go. He should have killed him. Do you, do you understand what I just said? Do you know what it means? They did it for years. All the firstborns killed that Moses himself narrowly escaped so anybody who's, who has a problem with says God had in his heart someone who killed children not see th there are criminals who know limits are you getting what I'm saying some bad people have a soft spot for children not Pharaoh not Pharaoh. So now, God doesn't just want to kill him. He wants to use him for an example. So when halfway, it is now clear that this is the Lord, God encourages him, mm, go to the end. <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> Because don't forget, again, I told you before the first play, God already knew where he was going. It is until I kill the firstborn that his eye will open. So you know what? Let's start with something I know he can do very well so that he will think that the distance is close. Go there and drop your rod. So, so, so very relaxed. <laughs> Did you see it? He calls all his people one after the other. They were dropping their rods. Dropping their rods. You have to understand the kind of person Pharaoh was. Is Pharaoh all powerful? No. Are his magicians all powerful? No. Why did God ask Moses to drop his rod? Because he knew that he's one of the magic that was in the palace. That was how God was teasing him. Ah, don't worry. Just try harder. Ah, they swallowed your serpent. It's because they didn't eat. <laughs> it's because they didn't eat. <laughs> you know, another, let me give you another example, for instance. It's just like Messi and Ronaldo now. Ah, 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 ah. If you know enter Messi, you don't, you don't think it's another pastor that is here? Allow me preach, oh, let me cook. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, God was just playing with C. Ronaldo fans as if he's close. As if he's close. One ballon d'or, you two. Yeah, half ballon d'or, yeah, ballon d'or. Two ballon d'or, two. Three ballon d'or. Now, five, six, seven, eight. Ah! Plus one cup. That's Exodus. <laughs> You think, you think we are mates? Hmm? We did, we did talk greatest of all time. You did compare with influencer. Instagram, Instagram influencer. <laughs> you know? You know? You know? Wait. Have you noticed ever since World Cup, it has changed from it's the greatest of all time. He has the most followers. Eh? We dash you. <laughs> <laughs> Influencer. <laughs> he sweets me. Now me, oh my. 
Sorry. <laughs> they, have you noticed they now say he's my goat? He's my goat. Fans, they amaze me. I don't. <laughs> he's my goat. If I deck you, he's my goat. It's my goat, God. <laughs> God just, God just carried them along until the end. When your goat is almost forty, that is when you not gave mercy. Sorry, where was I? <laughs> oh, you sweet me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, see when, by the time Pharaoh begins to wake up, it's too late. Pharaoh begins to negotiate. Look at Exodus chapter 10. This <laughs> Look at Exodus chapter 10, verse 24. We need to wrap this up as fast as possible. Then Pharaoh called Moses. You know, <laughs> remind me, the next time I'm here, I'm going to show you a text. It got to a point. The Egyptians began to revolt. That, do you want to put us in trouble? They began to confront Pharaoh. Can't you see that this man's God is against us? They, they went to carry Moses. They carried Moses to Pharaoh. Please go and negotiate. Go and talk. To <laughs> Make Una talk. Don't put us in trouble. But anyway, then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go and serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your heads be kept behind. Let your little ones also go with you. So he's negotiating. There's so many things. I, 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 I wish I had enough time. And we'll, we'll continue. Thank God it's a series. You know, in chapter 5, Moses in, in, initially said, let the children of Israel go for three days. Three days. He said, three days. Pharaoh no agree. And as he kept getting stubborn, the demands kept increasing. Now we are going. <laughs> Not three days. So Pharaoh said, okay, Go. But leave your livestock. See what Moses said. Not only are we not going to leave our livestock, you will give us the lambs that we will sacrifice to God. That's what he said. Look at the next verse. But Moses said, you must also give us sacrifice and burnt offering that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Come on, are you getting this? God wanted to push him to the wall. Humble his pride. Oh, you want us to live our livestock? Not only are we not going to live it, you will give us what we will sacrifice. Please say, believer's authority. It is worth taking you through this journey so that you will understand. You see, I've told you before, Satan is not the equal opposite of God. They are not mates. They are not mates. Leave Nollywood and read your Bible. They are not mates. They've never been mates. God has never fought Satan before. God. God. The God of the Bible. At the end of the age, it is Michael that will bind Satan with chains and throw him inside fire. Michael. <laughs> hey, Pastor Mark. <Mike. laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, it's, it's not God. Are you getting what I'm saying? And just see God schooling Pharaoh in power. Schooling him. Letting him think it's a close call and then humbling him. Aiding him in his folly 
so that all generations will learn. He said, for this purpose I raised you up. There's, this is the reason you didn't die since. Are, are you, I think it is Exodus 9, 16. He says, for this purpose I raised you up to make my power known in you. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If you understand this, you will understand that the challenges that God has allowed in your life are there for a reason. Yes, sir. Come on, are you with me? Yes, sir. What if you had that perspective where they bring word to Jesus that his friend Lazarus is sick? He said, this sickness is not unto death, but that the glory of God will be manifest. What if you saw problems that way? Because you see, God is over and above. Do you, do you know who God is? Come on, I get what I'm saying. When you understand this, what a confidence you will have. What an assurance you will have. It's a confidence that will make you stand before Pharaoh. He might be a great man, but he's not God. Are you listening to me? He might be great, but he's not God. And you see, the mere fact that they will come and say, let us go and worship. He said, oh, so you have time. Pharaoh was even angry. You mean there is a God you fear more than me? When I get work. When I know get work. So he doubled their tasks. Doubled their tasks. To keep them more in bondage. I'm going to talk about how <laughs> your job might be a pharaoh. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Don't worry. But let's talk about the pharaoh of the Bible first. Think about it. Do you know the kind of psychopath you have to be to see the Red Sea open? The children of Israel are going, you follow them. Do it. So let me tell you something. There are some people that believe that you are destined to be beneath them. That's, that's why. They just couldn't, he just couldn't see the children of Israel free. That's the problem. And that is the very thing that led him to his destruction. He just felt, are, are they not here? They, children? But we have a God in heaven. Are you listening to me? Do you believe what I'm saying? And it is pattern throughout the Bible that when people see you as small, see you as slaves, see you as something, someone that can never get anywhere in life, their wickedness will end up amplifying his glory in your life. That is how he does it. That is how he does it. The God of the Bible, excuse his expression, can be petty. <laughs> when it comes to showing forth his glory in his children. And so, just so I can wrap this up as quickly as possible, who is the God of the Bible? What was God trying to show them? Number one, he's a personal God. He's a personal God. You know, this was the first thing that shocked Pharaoh. How are you going to be telling Pharaoh, this is what God said, let my children... Uh, the children of Israel go that they may rejoice before me in the wilderness. Rejoice before you. Because his idea of God is an impersonal being who wants nothing to do with you. Who just once in a while will just have mood swing and destroy things. And you quickly sacrifice to placate him. So there is a God interested in his people. He couldn't understand that. And God revealed himself. Please be aware. You serve a God who truly loves you. Do you understand what I'm saying? And who has like such a beautiful obsession. When Jesus, who couldn't have been exaggerating, said that even the hair on your head is numbered. So if you are going bow, don't worry. Don't worry. God knows what he's doing. No be Bible. 
He knows what he's doing. Allow God. <laughs> Are you listening to me? But laugh and listen. He cares about you. Listen, do you believe that? That he cares for you? Say, he cares for me. Do you trust him? Do you rely on him? Say, he cares for me. So, uh, Paul is making that distinction. You are not, you, you were Gentiles, but understand that that's not, that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of the Bible. He cares for you. Amen, somebody. Say it again, he cares for me. Cares for me. Oh, you ought to say it louder. He cares for me. He cares for me. He's a personal God. Number two. He is a good and kind God. A good and kind God. Good and kind. Do you believe it? Tell him you are good and kind. You're not you're not worshiping an idol. Who is always angry. Whose anger you have to appease. He is good and kind. He cares for you. Listen. He is not the reason your loved one got sick. He's not the reason that relative died. He's good and kind. He cares for you. Let me tell you something. You see. There's a reason this is important. These are foundational issues in theology. See, warfare, believer's authority, is a theological issue. It's a theological issue. I'm telling you, when you know beyond any reasonable doubt that this God, this God is good and kind, that's something to war with. Do you believe it? I know you've been through a lot in life, but do you believe it? And number three, he's the God of all creation. There is no force on earth that can intimidate him. And I, I want to tell you <laughs> with every sense of confidence, listen, the Bible says, they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Listen, it doesn't matter if you're a shepherd boy, you can stand before Pharaoh because of who your God is. Are, are you listening to me? It, it, it doesn't matter your background. It matters who sent you. There is nothing you can't challenge. There is no city you can't enter into. You go in the name of the Lord. You go in the name of the one who sent you. Please, are you listening to me? This is a confidence to have. What kind of confidence did Elijah have to say, you know what? I'm tired of apologetics. Set your altar. The God that answers by fire, let him be God. What kind of confidence must you have? All other gods are the works of men. Ha hallelujah. Our own God is not one out of many. There is only one. Are, are you listening to me? There is no other name given under heaven by which men should be saved but by the name of Jesus. Come on, you believe it, don't you? Yes, if you believe it, you'll be confident out there. You look at people who have things they tie, you know, somewhere, you know, and, and you'll just be like, hmm. Hallelujah. You know, I was preaching in London. And a witch was passing. A deep hour, a witch was passing the church. And so she came in to come and test. And you trust God now. She never even sits. I saw a vision. I said, there's someone here. I, <laughs> I see you with candles and a magic book. You practice witchcraft, come out. So, so she was just surprised, you know, she came. You go humble, don't you understand? 
Do you understand what I'm saying? God did what he did with Pharaoh to give you confidence. Confidence. Are you getting what I'm saying? Every chance you get, drop your own rod. Are you listening to me? Don't let anyone intimidate you. And be bold. Talk like someone who knows his God. Knows her God. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. See, it doesn't matter how much praying you do. And this might seem somehow to you. I have discovered believer's authority comes. There has to be a knowledge, deep-rooted knowledge and confidence. Deep-seated. They that know. Is there any such person here? Yes. So he says, it's, it's not, it won't end in theology. He says, they will be strong and do exploits. That's the testimony of your life. Say, that's the testimony of my life. Say, that's the testimony of my life. I want to give you a few minutes. Just praise him right now. Thank him for that. Thank him for that. Who is like you, lion and the lamb, seated on the throne? Praise Adonai, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. Praise Adonai. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the sea, praise. Kasete kapaya. Kepalataya. Listen, I know time is fast spent. Can I give you a few minutes? See, worship him. Just tell him, I trust you with my life. I trust you with my life. What if you knew you will never meet a power in this world greater than the God that you know? That the God that sent Moses is your God. Don't you understand? Let every Pharaoh bow. Boast hey. in your God right now.
your God. That should give you a mentality of the backing that you have in your own life. I will always be victorious. The last time I was here, I told you we never lose. Don't you understand? The path of Emmanuel Iren is as the shining light that shines brighter and brighter onto a perfect day. If you ever see Joseph in prison, it's because that's the way to the palace. We never lose. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. All things. All things. Listen, I give you a prophetic instruction. Stop crying. The business deals you lost, stop crying. The friendships you lost, stop crying. The relationships that ended, stop crying. For we know. Don't you get it? We know that all things work together for good. We know. We know. Listen, we don't always see it. We don't always understand it. But we know. We know. We know. We know. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff. You see, it's not only Moses who has a rod. Hallelujah. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Hey. What a mentality David had. All the days of my life. Thank you, Father. Glory to your name. Just say it one more time, I never lose, I never lose. 